In this episode of Drive Through History, we'll drive to the birthplace and later the home of George Washington, perhaps the greatest American that has ever lived. And then we will examine the life of Chaim Solomon. Perhaps you've never heard of him, but it is said that an army runs on its stomach, and feeding an army takes boatloads of money. Chaim Solomon's skills at high finance were a key part of the effort to win the Revolutionary War. And after that, it's on to Noah Webster. Webster's linguistic skills, long hours, and dogged determination helped him create the first dictionary that defined what it meant to talk and write like an American. In this installment, we're going to investigate the life of our nation's very first president, a prototype of presidents, if you will, a man who symbolized our country at the dawn of a bold new age. A man whose name is synonymous with words like democracy and freedom. And he led our fledgling country into a seemingly hopeless war against what was, at that time, a mighty superpower. Any idea who we're talking about? You guessed it, George Washington. All right, I'm lost, again. Finally made it to George Washington's birthplace. We're here at the George Washington Birthplace National Monument where George Washington was born February 22nd, 1732. Now he was born the son of Augustine Washington and Mary Ball, members of the Virginia cultural and economic elite and descendants of English gentry. Now it was in this very place that young George took his first steps. We're here where George Washington spent most of his time, Mount Vernon Plantation. It's beautiful, isn't it? Despite his lack of formal education, George Washington learned the valuable science of land surveying. He would spend countless hours on horseback, making measurements, taking calculations. Soon his skills and abilities were widely known. There wasn't anybody who could navigate this backwater wilderness like George Washington. It wasn't long before the skills young Washington developed would serve him well, as he was soon called upon to serve Great Britain during the Seven Year War with the French, the war known today as the French and Indian War. By 1755, it was clear that the growing tensions between the English and French over disputed land in America would not be resolved except through war. So the British and the Americans, who were still British citizens at the time, prepared to do battle with the French. General Braddock, commander-in-chief of the British forces, invited young Colonel Washington and his Virginia buckskins to join his forces, with Washington serving as General Braddock's aide. As the English marched, a group of Shawnee and Delaware Indians appeared and offered to join the forces against the French. Washington urged Braddock to let them join, but he foolishly rejected their offer. Instead, Braddock decided to march his entire army into an open field and try to impress the French and the Indians with the size of his army and then lead a direct attack against them. Yeah, about that idea, yeah, uh, no, 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 that's a horrible idea. The stubborn Braddock marched 1,300 British troops toward Fort Duquesne, located in what is now Pittsburgh. The French commander had an army of only 855 men, but was prepared to use the tactics of ambush and guerrilla warfare. They cunningly set up in the woods, seven miles from the fort. The British army, as they marched through, was a sitting duck. Suddenly, a storm of bullets from an invisible enemy in the woods pounded the British. They returned fire, but with little effect. The Indians on the French side moved from tree to tree, easily picking off British soldiers, perfect targets in their bright red uniforms. Nevertheless, Washington bravely rode over every part of the field, carrying the general's orders. Two horses were shot from under him, and his coat was torn four times by musket balls, but he escaped without injury. Amazingly, of the 86 officers on horseback, Washington was the only one not shot down. As he later explained, by the all-powerful dispensations of providence, I have been protected beyond all human expectations. Casualties were high and the battle was brutal. And although the British lost hundreds of men, Braddock would not allow his men to retreat. Finally, Braddock himself was shot and fell to the ground wounded. 
With their leader down, the British turned and ran. The battle was over. The British abandoned everything to the enemy, even the private papers of the general. It was a horrible defeat for the English and the Americans. 714 troops, over half of the total, were shot down, compared to only 30 on the French and Indian side. <laughs> You guys ready? Okay, rolling. Now, after the battle, the Indians testified that they had singled out Washington on repeated occasions and shot at him many times, but never injured him. As a result, they thought that some sort of invisible force was protecting him, and therefore described him as the man who was the particular favorite of heaven, one who could never die in battle. It was a bitter defeat for George Washington, but at the same time, this campaign, along with others during the French and Indian War, served to highlight his growing stature as a soldier, a patriot, and a gentleman. Years later, when war broke out between the colonies and England, George Washington came to his country's aid yet again. He was appointed Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army because of his sterling reputation and demonstrated abilities as a soldier and leader. But keep in mind, the honor he enjoyed in this role wasn't all it was cracked up to be. In rebelling against the English in such a prominent role, he was quite literally putting everything on the line. His life, his family's life, and his wealth. Success, as we shall soon see, was not assured. The ragtag army General Washington commanded wasn't the crack, cutting-edge military the United States currently enjoys. In fact, it was quite the opposite. Washington's troops consisted of untrained, undisciplined farmers, fishermen, and merchants. He had the almost impossible task of training these novices to take on the best trained and greatest military power in the world at that time. Not only were Washington's troops inexperienced, but they were also heavily outnumbered. British General Howe commanded a force of 30,000 professional British troops, along with German hired fighters while Washington's troops numbered fewer than 10,000. On August 27, 1776, only a few months after the American Revolution had begun, General Howe trapped Washington and his troops on Long Island. With Washington trapped on the island, Howe planned to attack and destroy the Americans the following morning, expecting an easy victory. The revolution continued on for eight more long years, and as it turned out, trapping the Americans on Long Island was the best chance the British had to defeat them. But General Washington's skillful maneuvering and strategic retreat, along with a providential intervention, saved the Continental Army. Washington soon turned the tables on the British and crossed the Delaware River with his troops on December 26, 1776 winning a decisive victory over the German mercenaries at the famous Battle of Trenton. The impossible had been accomplished. A puny nation of nobodies had defeated the world's most powerful military despite barely having an army. The self-control of George Washington was an example to his men, teaching them when to fight and when to retreat. That kind of wisdom characterized Washington's leadership throughout the revolution, and finally, it ended in a complete victory and independence from the British. Since they had thrown off tyranny and oppression, a new nation needed a new leader. Anyone want to guess who they picked? It's Washington. Washington understood that every one of his actions as the nation's first president set a precedent not only for the new nation, but also for the presidents who came after him. He therefore flatly refused to be called a king and even publicly rebuked those who considered it. He therefore chose the title Mr. President, making it clear that his office was different than that of a king or a governor. He worked for unity and he inspired Americans with his integrity, his bravery, and his self-control. In many ways, he set the standard for what it means to be the President of the United States. And even now, millions of Americans consider him to be the greatest American who's ever lived.
Today, we're going to learn about America's first financier, Chaim Solomon. Chaim Solomon was a financial genius who helped keep the Continental Army afloat during the most crucial days of the Revolutionary War. He helped supply Washington's troops with badly needed supplies during the closing days of the war. The fledgling Continental Army was cash strapped. And Mr. Solomon stepped in to underwrite the war effort at the most crucial of times. For example, it is highly unlikely that the Americans would have won the Battle of Yorktown to end the revolution without the help of the French. It was Chaim Solomon working almost solely by himself who helped raise the necessary money to get French troops and the French fleet to the United States. Additionally, Chaim served as a spy for the United States. He not only risked his very life for America, but he also provided at least $200,000 of his own money, or almost $3.5 million in today's money, to the revolutionary cause. A huge sum for any one person. Now, Chaim Solomon was a Polish immigrant who fought for American liberty. Now imagine that. What would it take for you to leave your nation of origin go to an entirely foreign country to learn its customs and languages, and also risk life and limb to defend her. But that's exactly what Mr. Solomon decided to do. In Europe, he had experienced the persecution that the Russians had targeted against those who lived in Poland. And as a Jew, he knew the harshness of religious oppression that for centuries had wounded his Jewish brethren. A desire for freedom burned in the hearts of many Americans, especially among the so-called Sons of Liberty, and there was a growing resistance to British tyranny. The tension was originally caused by the 1765 Stamp Act, passed by the British Parliament. The Sons of Liberty saw the Stamp Act as a clear violation of the British Bill of Rights, a violation of no taxation without representation, they therefore organized a boycott of English goods, resulting in incidents such as the Boston Tea Party. In 1776, only four years after Chaim arrived, the Americans declared their independence from Great Britain. The British then responded by attacking New York City, and one of the early battles was the Battle of Long Island. New York was now occupied enemy territory. Chaim Solomon decided he could be useful as a spy for the Americans. In the midst of that occupation, Solomon was surrounded by British enemies, but he still nevertheless faithfully supported the Patriot cause, quietly gathering and supplying information to the Continental Army, until the British arrested him and threw him into prison in September 1776. Solomon's health suffered greatly while he was in prison, but eventually because he spoke fluent German, as well as French, Polish, Russian, and Italian, he received better treatment. You see, the British had hired 17,000 Hessians, or German mercenaries, to help fight against the Americans. Most of the Hessians could not speak a word of English, so when they realized that Chaim spoke fluent German, they made him an interpreter and moved him to a better location. Chaim translated their orders to the prisoners, but he also began telling the Hessians about opportunities in America and convinced many to desert the British army. Chaim also used his new position to help other prisoners and also to continue spying on the British. Chaim was eventually released. He returned to his business and also married a woman named Rachel Franks, who soon gave him a baby son. Chaim Solomon continued to help the American army by secret and in fact even housed wounded American soldiers in his home. One night, a loyalist neighbor, loyal to the crown, heard the moans of a wounded American soldier and reported Solomon to the authorities. He was then arrested and sentenced to be hung as a spy at sunrise on August 11, 1778. Even though known spies like Chaim were guarded especially closely, the Sons of Liberty were still nevertheless able to learn of his plight. They smuggled a secret message to him with an escape route, and Solomon was able to conceal a string of gold coins to purchase his freedom. And he followed the escape route in the black of night and was able to rejoin the American forces just north of New York City. The British were diligently trying to keep supplies from reaching the Patriots in America, using their navy to set up blockades around American ports such as New York City, Philadelphia, and Charleston. Despite these blockades, courageous seamen found ways to elude the British ships and enter the ports. 
And whenever a ship broke through and docked in Philadelphia, Hyam brokered exchanges of goods. Soon, Hyam was making high profits, but at a great personal risk. It was these profits that Hyam Solomon transferred over to the Continental Congress. It wasn't private gain that Solomon was interested in, but the success of the revolution that compelled him. As winter loomed ahead, General Washington and General Rochambeau, the leader of the French forces fighting alongside the Americans, wanted to attack New York and take it back from the British. But the American army was bankrupt. The American troops were starving, wearing rags, and demanding long overdue wages. Some of them had even gone three years without being paid. General Washington had recognized the financial expertise of a signer of the Declaration of Independence, a man named Robert Morris. So in 1781, Morris was appointed by Congress as the National Superintendent of Finance. Morris had already raised much money to fund the American Revolution, using both his shrewd business practices and personal wealth to help the army have what it needed to fight the British. Morris sought to avoid financial collapse and designed a plan for the struggling government. But the success of his plan depended on obtaining assistance from one of the best financial minds in Philadelphia, one Hyam Solomon. Morris and Solomon left no stones unturned as they sought funds to deal with each new financial crisis. And both men repeatedly gave from their own personal resources in order to help satisfy the unending calls for help. In the end, the constant stress eventually wore down the finances and the health of both men. Sadly, despite the fact that both Hyam Solomon and Robert Morris both earned hundreds of thousands of dollars during the last decade of the 18th century, they both died in debt, leaving their families with little money. They sacrificed their time, abilities, and finances for the cause of freedom. Now it's believed that Hayim Solomon is buried somewhere here at the Mikveh Israel Cemetery. In 1941, a monument in honor of Hayim Solomon, Robert Morris, and George Washington was dedicated in Chicago. General George Washington stands larger than life at the center of the sculpture, holding the hands of Hayim Solomon and Robert Morris. At the dedication, the mayor of Chicago said, George Washington and his friend Robert Morris were Christians, and Chaim Solomon was a Jew. These three, though of widely different walks of life, labored together in a common cause so that the American way of life could be preserved for future generations. Chaim Solomon was a true American hero. Officer, uh, is it okay if I park here? Greetings, my recce strange migrant. I make pleadings to the celestial being that your pilgrimage thus far has been fruitful. But be not bedeviled, for the pained inquiry of your hallowed locust is indeed a rightful sanctuary for your ramshackle convenience. So is that a yes? You got it! Come on! Get on all day! Move along! Move along! Whew. Some pretty high standards for traffic cops in Washington, D.C. Luckily, I have my trusty Webster's Dictionary that I keep in the Hummer at all times. What was that word he said? Uh, rakish? Transponder? That oh, doesn't matter. You ever wondered about this book, Webster's Dictionary? Who was Webster and how come he knew so many words? Well, it was published by a man named Noah Webster. Noah Webster, Webster's Dictionary, get the connection or do I have to spell it out for you? <laughs> Anywho, Noah Webster was an American lexicographer or dictionary creator. He was also a textbook author, a Bible translator, a writer, and an editor. And his impact on America was long-lasting and very profound. Americans use Webster's Dictionary all the time, but they rarely stop to consider the immense amount of work and labor that went into creating it. Now, when Webster first published his dictionary in 1806, dictionaries were rare. And this was America's first attempt at creating her own. 
Now, he's also known for impacting America in many other ways. He was a soldier during the American Revolution. He was a writer, an educator, a legislator, and a judge. But he's still mostly known for publishing the dictionary and giving us the meaning of countless words. We take that for granted. Take this simple newspaper, for instance. If I come across a word I don't understand, all I have to do is look it up and figure it out. He was a bright, studious lad. And in 1774, when he was only 16 years old, Noah Webster entered Yale College. Now, over the next three years, the fighting of the American Revolution disrupted classes at Yale, and twice Noah left Yale to join the local militia as they went to fight the British. Inside the campus, political discussions were feverish and impassioned. The future of the 13 colonies was in question. And if that wasn't enough, the faculty also called off classes for another reason typhoid fever. Now, some good did come from these horrific experiences, however. It stimulated Webster's thinking along medical lines, and in 1800, he published a two-volume work on the subject of medicine and disease. It was a huge success and became a virtual textbook in medical schools across the country, and it became regarded as one of the most important works ever written on the subject by a layman. Now, the definition of layman means someone who's not a professional. I don't think that word applies to me. I thought we'd pop into the Alexandria Library to see what else we can discover about Noah Webster. So how did America's favorite wordsmith write his dictionaries anyway? Well, he would stand around a table like this one with dictionaries from all over the world open before him. Then he would ponder a word. Oh, I don't know, I'm thinking of the word ripped. Then he would pick up the Greek dictionary and look up the Greek definition for ripped. And after seeing a picture of me, then he would move on to the next one, the German dictionary, then the Arabic, then the Hebrew, the Spanish, and so forth. 20 languages in all. Now when he had collected all the information he could on the word he was working on, then he would write his definition. And speaking of definition. Shh. Sorry. It's fine. After eight long years, the war against the British came to a close, and the Americans had won the revolution. But now there was a nation to create, literally from scratch. We were not a united nation, and we desperately needed a stronger form of government. Noah confronted this problem head on. He spoke and wrote about the need for a stronger federal government and for more national unity. In fact, he became one of the first Americans to call for a constitutional convention. When the constitutional convention convened in Philadelphia, Webster was also in the city. He organized get-togethers with many of the delegates and participated in heated discussions about the weaknesses of the old government and the need for a new, stronger one. Some of his specific ideas made it into the new Constitution. And when it was finished, the delegates asked Webster to draft an essay in support of the new form of government, which he did, and then dedicated that work to the national hero, Benjamin Franklin. Webster's essay galvanized national support for the Constitution, and it contributed greatly to its later ratification and adoption by the states. Webster's vision for education in America was a purely American system of education, one that was grounded in religious and moral truths. Now, this was a revolutionary idea, and convincing others of the need for a purely American system of education would be a daunting task, but Webster accepted the challenge. He therefore began writing such textbooks in 1782, publishing the first American spelling book where he introduced the American spelling of words, a book called The Blueback Speller. From the north to the south, from the Atlantic to the Pacific, Webster's Blueback Speller not only taught Americans how to read, but also standardized the language they spoke, taught them moral and religious truths, and unified the entire nation. Hi, boys and girls. It's story time with Uncle Davy, talking about the story of Noah Webster, the man who helped Americanize the English language. Now, Noah Webster was an umbunctuous type of feller. 
he was just fantastic in his adventures and contributions to American society. Mel Webster, to my understanding, was not necessarily a boxer, nor was he Amish, and he did not have facial hair. Nevertheless, we're going to illustrate my point with this gentleman right here. How do you spell the word labor? L-A-B-O-R, right? Well, if you lived in England speaking the King's English, you'd put a little U in there. Well, Noah decided that U was a little extra, some extranacious. So he decided to take the U out of many words like this. And that's how you spell labor. L-A-B-O-R. Labo. Labor. Labo. La Hold on a second. You know, I'm reading glasses on. Tarnation. Hold on just a minute. Noah Webster published his last textbook when he was 81 years old. In it, he stressed the importance of persevering. When asked what contributed to his own remarkable vigor and long life, he listed four guidelines. Go to bed early and do not worry. Get up early. Exercise mentally and physically every day. And keep a clear conscience void of offense toward God and man. Webster continued to produce his dictionary along with many other works for many years until finally in 1843 his life ended.